So, if you have any questions, comments, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to start my remarks with uh, at the global scale, and then gradually move to some national statistics and challenges that we face, and then I'll narrow in on some of the issues we're confronting in the southeast. So this may be a bit of a high-level bird's eye view. Uh, I apologize, I'll try to make it as relevant as I can. Um, I wanted to begin by looking to the future. It used to be the case when the United States dominated energy uh, production and consumption in the world, that simply our choice of uh, energy products and technologies would drive the rest of the world because we dominated the uh, choice of the equipment. So back in pre-Arab oil embargo times, just after 1975, we were responsible for 30% of the energy consumed in the world. Today, that is now about 19%. And looking to the future, it's only going to be about 13%. We have very um, significant growth in consumption in the, the uh, Asia, Middle East, you know, increasingly industrializing countries. The United States energy consumption, on the other hand, might go at one or two percent a year. So um, in the future, if we want to try to influence the energy choices that the rest of the world is going to have to be to the technologies that we develop, and by illustrating the capability to leapfrog to cleaner options um, than we have used in the past. We are the envy of many countries around the world. When I've spent time in energy debates in Europe in particular, France and England just recently, they are so envious at our increasing uh, fossil fuels. So with the uh, hydrofracking of natural gas, and oil, unconventional oil production in the U.S., we are going to become a major gas exporter over the next few decades. We are also going to be a major oil exporter. The Energy, Ener Energy Information Administration uh, latest report estimates that we're going to be the world's largest oil exporter. Hard to believe. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have to import also. <laughs> will be a net gas exporter, a net oil importer, but we're still going to be in the marketplace and it's going to be big. So you can see most of the rest of the world is moving in the direction to the right and up, which means they are increasing in their oil imports and they're increasing in their gas imports, some of them reaching about 100%, some of them actually Japan is already at about 100% for both. But if you look at the European Union, going from 80 to 95 percent, India from 70 something to 90 percent um, oil imports over the next couple of decades. <clears throat> so, what does this largesse of this bonus of cheap oil and cheap gas going to mean for the future of alternative energy resources? Very big, very big question. We'll talk a little bit about that. But I'm going to put it in the context of global climate change. So I'm also a, a member of the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and was a co-author of the last report and I'm an editor of the report that will be rolled out in 2014 on mitigation options. And all of the mitigation options are put in the context of a future in which we don't know the degree to which greenhouse gas emissions and concentrations in the atmosphere are going to increase, but that the span of possibilities is going to be somewhere between a 2 degrees C and a 6 degrees C increase. So the 2 degrees C, which is the most modest increase, that's comparing temperatures at the turn of the century with temp temperatures at the turn of the, ninth, <laughs> the 20th century, 1900, for almost pre-industrial is usually the way they put it, from pre-industrial to the year 2100. Two degrees C, 
um, is the scenario that everyone hopes for. It's the European Union's goal. It's the commitment that was made in the Copenhagen um, Conference of the Parties that they would attempt to re uh, constrain temperature rises to two degrees C. But in fact, when you look at the policy um, interventions required for that to happen, it's it's almost impossible. In fact, when you calculate the amount of CO2 emissions that are already locked in because of the enduring capital infrastructure that we have in this country, the longevity of uh, power plants, highways, buildings, uh, industrial facilities, we've already locked in 80% of the budget of CO2 that we have available to stay within that 2 degree C rise. So most of us think that that is probably a goal that's already essentially known that will be broken. So then you move down to well, what about 3.5 degree C rise and that could happen with again aggressive policies but ones which seem a little bit more attainable. If nothing is done we're going to be facing that 6 degree C future. Now the, um, those were the um, findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United States has its own national climate assessment process. And that looks at what climate change might mean for individual regions of the country. So I picked out one of the maps for the southeast, which is um, shows the number of days per year with peak temperature over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the left side is um, 1961 to 79, and the rate is for the end of this century. And you can see, if you look at Alabama, uh, or if you look at Georgia, we're kind of in the 60 days now, heading to something more like 160. So when you focus in on the challenges we face, they are significant. It's not just warming, it's also sea level rise. Um, and water issues, in particular, you know, shrinking freshwater access. So, what is the likelihood of all of this coming about? Well, in the policy sciences and in economics, there's a theory that's called the environmental Christmas theory. It's an economist, an English economist, who suggested that as countries become more affluent, they're going to place an increasing premium on their um, natural resources. Natural capital is going to gain in value. That means that you would find over time a huge inverted U-shaped curve. So as countries develop initially, they burn up a lot of um, stuff they pollute and they don't much care because they're trying to meet the basic needs of survival, survival for their citizenry. But then they gradually begin to taper off as they reach some level of sustenance and appreciation for environmental quality. And then presumably they would begin to see a decline in their um, pollution. Well, I don't see much of a decline. There are a couple of countries, maybe the UK, maybe the US, where over time, we have seen that GDP per capita has risen and the energy per capita has become stable or slightly reduced, meaning that source of pollution appears to be somewhat under control. But look at the rest of the world. Look at what's going on with China and Korea. Look. So you see this lockstep of economic development with energy consumption. Now the United States has done pretty well, although my um, bottom line is going to be that there's a whole lot more we can do. If you look at this chart, which is a product of Steve Nadell, um, who's from the American Council on Energy Efficient Economy, you could argue that energy efficiency has contributed more to the energy budget of the United States than any other resource. Here's how you would arrive at that conclusion. You look at the blue wedge. 
So the blue wedge is created by um, estimating if we use energy as inefficiently today as we did in the year 1970, that is on an energy per GDP basis, our consumption based on GDP growth would be about 200, 200 quads today. Our budget, our energy budget would be twice what it is today if we use energy as inefficiently as we used to. Now you can't be quite so simplistic because in addition to using energy more efficiently, we're also importing a lot of energy intensive goods. So you have to remove from that wedge the energy service demand that we're needing through imported goods. But even when you take off that little white wedge at the top, you can see the blue wedge is enormous. We have made a lot of progress. But much <coughs> more is needed. And one of the ways that uh, engineers like to characterize the existing economic potential for energy efficiency is by developing supply curves that identify for each technology how much it costs uh, and how much it could, energy it could save. And we use the levelized cost of electricity, or in this case, it's called the cost of conserved energy. This was done in the National Academy of Sciences report that I co-authored in 2009. This is an example of what we could do in the residential and commercial sectors. How many terawatts of electricity per year we could save with each one of these technologies. So if you step up the blue curve, that would be the residential options, you could quickly get, for instance, to number two here, which is lighting. Lighting and housing is a tremendous opportunity for very cheap uh, energy savings. Costs about mm, one cent per kilowatt hour to replace incandescent lamps with fluorescence, maybe it costs a little more to replace with LEDs, but wait and the story will change, I am sure. And look at how much you can save, going all the way from uh, uh, more than 100 terawatt hours. So plenty of opportunities uh, for improving our efficiency in the future. And technologies are improving. Energy efficiency uh, skeptics talk about how well, we've done that. You know, you show me the blue wedge. There's no more <coughs> blue wedge. That's it. All right. We can't improve how we use it, energy anymore. Well, that's not true. And this is a, a couple of diagrams from a recent Department of Energy report. Very readable. I think it's only 12 pages long. It has great graphics. It's called <laughs> Revolution Now: The Future Arrives for Four Clean Energy Technologies. So I've just got two here, LED lighting and solar panels. The two that are not here, unfortunately, I wish I'd brought them along, wind and, and uh, batteries. But these, these two are illustrative of the others. So they're all done the same format. The um, bars show the costs. So we're going down, in this case, it's. Um, LED lighting costs per lumen dropping significantly, and this is the market penetration. Here we have a deployment and cost of solar photovoltaic modules, again, tremendous drop, and a large uh, market penetration. This is an example of a learning curve. There are, you know, there are lots, there's a whole discipline wrapped around how quickly do technologies improve as you expand their production. Now this is a science that's been going on for hundreds of years, people looking at, now since the Industrial Revolution actually, where they looked at the production costs over time as cumulative production increases. Um, on the other hand, of course, you may at any point come up with uh, material limits, maybe lithium for and lithium ion batteries or something, and we can't always anticipate that the same learning shape and rate will be replicated. 
but it miraculously does seem to track this power function over time in increasing uh, savings. So some of the work that I've done is uh, a little bit different. I've looked at policy options. Okay, so people say, well, you know, the $20 on the sidewalk uh, would have been picked up. They say that uh, these technologies may be great, but for some reason they're not being adopted, so they must not be attractive. What I've done is to ask, well, what can we do if we put in place a set of policies that we've got a pretty good basis for concluding might motivate more adoption? So this is a policy supply curve, and it marches up the cost and across from left to right the same way that those technology curves do. You can find, in looking at policy curves like this, what policies um, cost how much and to what extent can they deliver savings. And two of my favorite policies don't have any technology specificity and that is uh, energy benchmarking and market priming. So let me give you an example of the energy benchmarking. The cities of um, Philadelphia, Seattle, New York, Boston, and Austin, where's my Austin guy? Uh, yep. Have required that all commercial buildings reveal their energy uh, consumption on an annual basis and put it into the portfolio manager system of the Environmental Protection Agency. So, this means that if you're in the market to rent, a facility in a commercial building, you can go and you can see to what extent is this facility really energy efficient. If you are an owner, you can report and compare your energy performance against the rest of the marketplace in that city. And with that better information, as economists always say, uh, more information, the more efficient markets will work, they'll gradually develop a better, stronger market for energy efficiency, because you can now prove, or at least better communicate, the performance of your real estate. And you can ask for higher uh, rent. And if you're a tenant, you can ask for a lower rent if it's not a particularly good building, right? So that's the sort of thing we find when we examine policies. Um, so, when, <laughs> so there has been a little bit of kickback. As I've, uh, you know, I've been in the energy efficiency business um, since I started uh, my career probably just after the oil embargo, it was a long time ago. And <clears throat> only lately have I been confronted with some of the, some really sharp criticism. There are two of them in particular I wanted to tell you about. First, before we get to this great cartoon, there's the criticism of social engineering. So when I was um, be being interviewed in, as a presidential nominee for the TBA Board of Directors by senators in the seven states, I had a couple of them ask me if I approved of social engineering. And, <laughs> I honestly didn't know how to answer them. I, you know, I, I don't know what you mean. And they wouldn't elaborate. Then I learned, after doing some investigation, that that's a synonym for energy efficiency. <laughs> yes, because if, you, if, you, if you're supportive of social engineering, that must mean that you think you can manipulate how the choices that people make. And so since I'm an energy efficiency nut, that I must also be, um, you know, a manipulative uh, psych psycho or something. I guess was anyway. I put the picture together afterwards. And How'd you answer that? I, I actually, I, I sort of hunted. I should have said I thought that the uh, TVA Act uh, committed that organization to improving the lives of the Tennessee Valley residents. And that if that's not social engineering, you know, <laughs> that request for social engineering, but I wasn't fast enough on my feet. 
And the second criticism is that if you help people to save energy, they're just going to turn around and consume more products that require more energy. And so the best way to explain this is in terms of the Prius effect. So if you own a Prius, you're just going to drive, drive, drive because it's so <laughs> energy efficient. And I think that in fact there is some truth to this. If you ha were to have LED lighting so cheap that you could light everything really cheap, I probably would find new, new uses for lighting. Like I might light my sidewalk so that I don't trip. Or you know, better uses for more lighting. On the other hand, I also don't... I don't think it works for every product. So just because I have a new energy efficient vacuum cleaner, <laughs> know where I'm going, doesn't mean I vacuum anymore. So I just don't, I think that it's an unfair thing. But it is being used in a very sophisticated way, in fact, including a cover story in the New Yorker magazine about a year ago. So we do have a lot of um, skeptics that we need to prepare arguments for in anticipation of their concerns and to try to help inform people um, about energy efficiency. And speaking of information, we know that information is empowering, especially um, in the um, in terms of home metering. There's just been a breakthrough of new technologies available can't manage what you can't measure. And there's so much more uh, cheap technology available to meter your home and to meter your office building, tell you how you're using energy. And the one that I bought in my new edition, uh, Ken, the one over my garage, with my heat pump, yeah, there you are, is, is this Nest thermostat. And it is really smart. So the thermostat also has a sensor, a motion sensor, and it knows when I'm not in the room and it turns everything off. I mean, the heating and cooling off. So it also has a memory and it puts all of my um, consumption history up on a website so I can compare this week against last week and you know, eventually against last year. Um, it is just really brilliant. So I, and it only costs about $250. So turning to uh, renewables, this is the forecast of the Energy Information Administration about the future of the United States. So this is the uh, 2013 <coughs> Annual Energy Outlook. So it's the official forecast for renewables. In particular, I picked out non-hydro renewable generation. Um, it suggests that today's 5% of uh, non-hydro renewables is going to grow to a whopping 12% by the year 2040. So the official forecast is, is really uninspiring, don't you think? <laughs> um, after, you, after hearing of, about all these opportunities and, and wind, solar, hydro, we haven't talked about bio and CHP and, and pulp and paper industry, um, some of the biggest advances in renewables have occurred in those states that have renewable portfolio standards. I think in the United States, that's been the driving um, policy measure. You know, abroad, it's been feed-in tariffs, as in Germany and Asia, where they'll give you a, a premium, a long-term contract with a premium to buy renewables if you'll put them on the grid. Well, here we require that utilities meet a certain goal of percent renewables or certain megawatt hours per year of renewables over time. They step that number up every so often. So for instance, California's goal is now uh, 20%. Let me read that. <laughs> It's 32, 30, what does that say? 33 percent. I can't even read the number. Anyway, it's probably not going to be met, but they have met their previous two goals. And most of the states around the country have met their goals. These goals are goals that come with penalties, too. This is not, you do have some states 
I'm sorry. The goals that are non-binding with no penalties are in blue. The standards that come with penalties are in green, and they have in general been met. On the right side, you see the same map for the energy efficiency resource standards. Again, these are uh, binding requirements on utilities to meet a certain amount of their, what would be production, by investing in energy efficiency. So in, uh, on the left, uh, we see nine states do not have in the south, do not have an RPS, and we also see nine states in the south do not have an EARS. But we have a small difference I wanted to uh, highlight, and we can thank Ken Smith for that. In Arkansas, we have energy efficiency resource standard, yay. So gradually making progress, the map on the right has been shifting. The one on the left has pretty much been stagnant for a while. But uh, I think it'll pick back up now that the economy is picking back up. There are also many southern cities that have uh, uh, agreed, signed uh, on to the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, which has to do with the commitment to reduce CO2 by 2020 below 1990 is the commitment. Now it's not binding, it's a goal, it's, a, it's an aspiration, but it does show a, uh, a level of concern and many, I think more than a thousand cities across the U.S. now have signed up for this. I did want to also talk about combined heat and power. I was so glad that that, uh, Gary, thank you for bringing that up. Yep. It is a very big opportunity, especially in the Southeast, because the Southeast has, uh, depending on how you define the, the Southeast, the South, has something like 40% of U.S. activity in the industrial sector. We've got a lot of heavy industry here, a lot of thermal production that could uh, be used to um, take that waste heat and drive a generator. So we've done some, some work on that. I, I think Gary said it's not happening because it's so cheap. I don't, but maybe it's part of it. But I think it's really not happening because of uh, decoupling. I'm a policy walk, so I'm always turning to what what policy is broken? You know, if it's so cheap, why isn't it happening? I think it's not happening because utilities do not get a profit on the power that they purchase. They don't get a pro if they don't own the assets, they're not putting any equity into the project. If they don't own the CHP system, they will not get a return on equity <laughs> from that system. And it's a little bit the same in TVA land. I've been pushing this. First, we don't have profits to shareholders, or you know, nobody. We're not traded on the stock exchange, but we do have a debt, and we are concerned about revenues. The more revenues buy down the debt. So it's a little bit the same thing. If we're not making the revenue, so we can't relieve the debt burden as quickly. So we're not as incentivized, except that I've been pushing. <laughs> and we do have some good examples of success there. The Weyerhaeuser um, plant in Columbus, Mississippi, which is a pulp paper plant, is selling its excess power back to TVA after a protracted agreement there. It's about 20 megawatts of excess power they have from a, a generator that was that they were actually going to retire because they had a big pulp, big pulping operation which makes most of the material for diapers across the U.S. And then they used to have a paper mill that produced the finished product and that used a lot of the electricity that they uh, produced on site. Well when the paper mill went bankrupt. They ended up with too much generator capacity and 20 megawatts of excess power. So uh, it was in their best interest. They had a lot of waste biomass that they could use, heat that would otherwise be wasted, and they were looking for somebody to buy that power. And logical place was TVA, and, and finally a deal was struck. But there's so many more opportunities for that. The reason um, that Besides it's being so cheap, one of the reasons I like combined heat and power is because it's also a job generator. 
So we've been dancing around this job story all morning, and everyone has said energy efficiency and renewables generate jobs. Well, here is how they generate jobs. <clears throat> the way that you look at job generation from an input-output approach is you look at how, uh, say, a million dollars of expenditure somewhere in the economy, say a million more natural gas is bought, or a million more electricity. And then you look at what sectors of the economy gain economic activity from that. Well, you have pipe fitters and contractors of various sorts. And you spread that, you distribute that across the, in, in most uh, input output models, it's something like 400, 404 economic sectors. And you see the multiplication. So you now have more accountants, you need more insurance, and they, then those employees, they go home and they have more money, and they go and they buy more goods. So it filters through the economy. Well, if you take a look at the total impact of a million dollars in CHP construction and installation, you get a return of 14, 14 jobs. If you look at CHP operation and maintenance, non-fuel, you get 19.8 jobs. If you just look at increasing natural gas, six jobs. Electricity, six. Coal and petroleum, seven and respending of utility bill savings, 15. So the point here is that energy efficiency is labor intensive. You get a lot of jobs from it, unlike the capital intensive nature of power production and, and fuel production. So I wanted to try to explain that. <laughs> Um, it ends up that the investment in combined, so I was on a, a panel on this with um, the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at the time, John Wallinghoff, and Tom Caston, who's a big name in this field. And I told him, I want to make the point that CHP is so good, not just because of the jobs you get when you build a plant. Everybody loves to have a plant built in their county, you know, um, it's, it's a real boost for the economy. But it's because after you have it in place, you're generating such cheap power that everyone's rate is going, rates are going to go down. And now you have a whole array of bill savings across the economy, the residential, the commercial, all the other industrial um, consumers are going to face a better, lower electricity price because CHP is so inexpensive. And it's that impact that far outweighs the jobs created from the construction of this plant. That's just the drop in the bucket. It's what it does to the rest of the economy, making it so much more energy efficient. And so at the end of my webinar with them, Tom Caston said to me, thanks for showing us how many jobs are created by a building when you build a CHP plant. I don't think I made my point at all. I hope you understood. There's now actually a term that's been created. It's called the DRIPE term. So that might help. Anyone heard of DRIPE? All right, what is it, Max? Demand reduced production induced price effect. Right. Demand reduction induced price effect. If you reduce demand, you're going to reduce prices. I mean, that's sort of a natural, that's like an economic law. <laughs> um, so if we can reduce demand for this electricity, we're going to drop prices and everyone will benefit. And more money will be spent in other places in the economy. Oh, this is my last slide. Um, grounds for optimism. Always do like to, as Michael said, leave on a high, high note. Um, one good fortunate thing is that most of what we will have in place in the year 2050 is not here now. 
much of the infrastructure is yet to be built, and we know that technology is improving and it will be a better infrastructure. Right? Clean technologies are improving. We saw that with the DOE report. And the grassroots efforts are gaining traction in the clean energy arena, as we've seen here. Um, Carbon emissions have only just begun to be priced. Once they are priced, we're going to unleash all kinds of innovative talent across this country, and we're going to have new products, better products, and we're going to be able to handle the CO2 challenge um, more efficiently. So while we await federal action, there's a lot going on in states and localities, and a lot that we can do to continue to push ahead. So thank you.